Chapter 66, Practical Experience, 4. Temporary Laboratory in the Euclid Mansion. I looked closely at the ashes under the microscope. I tried to understand it on a particle-by-particle -particle basis, injecting mana and tearing it apart with, psychokinesis. Professor. Look at this. Kelladen shouted, pointing to the blackboard. Scratch, 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 scratch. A sophisticated report was being written on the green surface. Sylvia here. We captured a debutante who had been puppeted and separated him from the ashes. The result of our analysis is as follows. She discussed how the ashes encroached upon the debutante and what the process of that puppeteering was. The way Sylvia analyzed and separated the specimen with her own magic was almost at an anatomic level. A certain thought popped into my mind as I looked at it. Separation. Separation of ashes and the debutantes. What if a circuit that neutralized the control of the ashes was added to the formula of the barrier? Beyond that, what if the barrier was constructed in the magic tower and then completed? It's possible. Implanting a circuit in specific magic, known as magic weaving, had already been done dozens of times. My, psychokinesis, was created that way. What's possible? Kaladin asked. I'll make a barrier that breaks down ashes and deliver it to the debutantes. A barrier? It would take too long. I shook my head. Since it wasn't completely new magic, the consumption of mana wouldn't be severe. Right now, decomposition, was a common spell that was used even in garbage dumps. It is quite possible. If I envision it and add the talents of Sylvia and Afarine, of course, it's possible. Um, Professor? He stared at the blackboard without saying a word and pondered. There was no need to take notes. All of this was going to happen in my head. Attention! A disrupting shout echoed. I turned to the entrance, feeling the urge to kill. Eleven individuals of unknown name stood where I was looking, forming a line. The Imperial Knights. Attention, please! When the knight yelled again, a familiar voice came from behind him. Humph! So noisy! It was the Emperor's voice. As I was about to express proper curtsy, I abruptly stopped. The creature that showed up proudly wasn't the Emperor. In this possessed state, my ears are sensitive. Don't talk loudly. She had plenty of red furs, and her long tail fluttered, but her legs were short. It was a luxurious-looking cat. Your Majesty? Yes, Dika Lane. It's one of the magic that I learned. I'm too lazy to go outside. Hey! Don't touch my tail. I'm sorry. I was speechless for a moment. Possession was part of harmony magic. Complete possession, which borrowed the mouth and eyes of living beings, was quite difficult to learn. Naturally, however, she could fully utilize it. Moreover, the munchkin she used was a royal breed. The quality of the emperor's mana was currently level 2, and once an awakening event was held in the future, she'd reach level 1. She was a genius who had the talent to master all the skills in the world, after all, including magic and sword skills. If I were to express Emperor Sophine in one sentence, it would be the person closest to God. That indolence could either be a blessing or a curse to this world. Lower your back. Yes. The cat jumped over the knight's back. Oh. However, her first attempt failed since her legs were too short compared to the knight's large body. This guy. Bend further down. I'm sorry. This time, the munchkin successfully climbed on the knight's back. She grinned, patting his pharynx with her tail to express her satisfaction. Don't you dare move an inch. My legs are short, so it's dangerous. The emperor slapped the knight with her front paw. Yes. Don't scream either. Everyone, get out of the way. At that time, George, the court wizard, appeared as well. Rumors that the Emperor's cat was here seemed to have spread. Your Majesty. How can you master possession magic so perfectly? Annoying. How did he know? George looked at the red cat with thrilled eyes. Not long after, however, he swiftly hardened his expression. Professor de Calane. What are you going to do from now on? I intend to invent a barrier magic that decomposes ashes. Invent a barrier? Yes one that decomposes ashes alone. You. Want to create a new barrier? George asked, his voice full of doubts. That's right. How long will it take you to come up with that magic? It won't take a day. What? It's a simple task. 
It's not that surprising. No, you need to elaborate on it further. I had no time to waste on explanations. I spoke kindly but stubbornly. No matter what happens, I'll lead. Hence, I take responsibility for this too. George clicked his tongue but nodded anyway. Okay. Anyway, if you're creating a barrier, what about the formula? Have you written it down on a scroll? George asked. I looked at George without saying a word. The silence between us continued for a little while. I was thinking about how to explain it, but even that in itself was already a waste of time. I just tapped my temple with my finger. It's all in my head. What? The cat asked. If I were to explain it in a sentence. I used mental calculation. The debutantes were certain it was three o'clock, but they didn't know if it was in the morning or afternoon. Regardless, Sylvia and the others stared blankly at the blackboard. An expansive formula filled its surface. Below the magic circle that D. Cullain invented himself, there was the following sentence. Can you cast this barrier? It's possible, Sylvia answered on behalf of everyone, stunned. Lucia could do nothing but shrug as she looked at her. Right. It's not impossible if we could draw and recreate his formula. D. Cullain's barrier explanation was detailed and friendly. Even a debutante could understand it. The problem was that the barrier's magic circle was too large. Its total area covered the entire third floor. This room will serve as its center. I'll go out and draw the formula on the third floor. As for the mana it requires. We should have enough since there are many wizards here. Efferin said, looking around the classroom. Including herself, there were around 50 of them. If they were to collectively use their mana, it wouldn't be difficult to activate the barrier. Won't we need a catalyst to construct it? At Julia's concern, Sylvia loosened her own necklace. It was an artifact made entirely of mana diamonds, her mother's keepsake. It was imbued with several special effects, including mana storage expansion and magic amplification. Use this as a catalyst. Are you sure? Lucia, who knew the value of her necklace, asked, astonished. Sylvia didn't answer. HMPF. If you want to go that far, then. Sighing, Lucia also loosened the bracelet on her wrist. These two will suffice. My bracelet is an heirloom worth 20 million illness. T20 million. Got it. I'll be drawing the formula now. A fairy then cut her long hair in one swing, which surprised Lucia. Are you insane? Why did you cut it? Your hair can't be used as a catalyst. You know that, right? Don't you have a brain? Gosh. Who said I would use it as a catalyst? It gets in the way when I move. Iffy, it's okay. Ignore her. Julia calmed a fairy. She then trimmed her hair that had been cut arbitrarily. Okay it's pretty now. Sylvia then pulled her long hair up. Now tied into a ponytail, it ran down the back of her porcelain neck. Wow, Sylvia. You look beautiful. Seeing Eurozen and the others complimenting her, Ephraim momentarily felt regretful. I just had to pull it up too. A fairing. You're fast, so I'll leave the formula drawing to you. I'll draw the monster's attention to minimize the threat that'll be coming after you. Draw their attention? Yes. Just like what we did in the practical exercise. A fairy nodded. A short sentence on the blackboard then calmed and comforted them. I'll trust and wait. That was all they needed. Okay. Let's go. After finishing their preparations, the two broke the barrier in the classroom. Thump. The tremoring sound rang again but Afarian and Sylvia didn't hesitate to open the door, finding the infected debutantes and huge golems made out of ashes. As Sylvia caught their attention, Afarian cast, self-psychokinesis, and clung to the third floor ceiling. Whoosh! Sylvia coated the golems' bodies with pure white paint-like magic, which soon turned into a flame that exuded extremely high temperatures. Her targets burned in an instant. At the same time, Sylvia covered the pavement in blue, which soon turned to ice that made the infected debutantes on it flounder, unable to take even a few steps. However, at some point, thick ashen appendages, like the kraken's tentacles, gripped Sylvia's waist. They then flailed her around and slammed her onto the pavement. Ouch! Letting out a single groan, she immediately erased the tentacles without showing any pain. However, her stomach felt hot, as if she just gained an internal injury. Sylvia staggered, staring at the dark hallway. 
Click, click. The sound of heels hitting the ground echoed. It's useless. Sylvia looked at the existence that appeared in the dark. Professor Lewina. She, the head professor of the kingdom's university tower, had become a monster that assimilated with the ashes. You have a strange talent. I'm jealous. Her voice sounded bizarre yet muffled. I'll kill you because I'm jealous. She grinned, the corners of her mouth stretching to the bottom of her ears as if tearing her face apart. More ashes flooded down from her lips, taking on the form of a huge blade. Whoa oh oh oosh. Sylvia made her surroundings her own, deleting her weapon before it could even reach her. These are. The three primary colors. Bearing witness to Sylvia's creation, Luina muttered with admiration. A magic equivalent to a miracle. It breaks reality, interferes with the status quo, and recreates all things as its caster desires. Taking advantage of her monologue, Sylvia drew a cage and locked her in. A nonsensical origin that can roam the entire world at will. Clank. Luina, banging on the grate and licking her lips, clenched both of her fists. With a twisted, raccoon-like expression, she spat out curses. Fuck. The world is so unfair. This doesn't make sense. None of this fucking makes sense. Ashes exploded soon after that. With the bars around her now broken, Luina's fist connected against Sylvia's stomach, delivering a blow loaded with speed and weight. Ah! She bounced off and hit the wall. At that moment, her chest tightened. Her broken ribs pierced her lungs, and she couldn't breathe. Humph! You keep erasing my ashes with various techniques, but it doesn't matter. You're going to die anyway. The difference between them was so great she thought she might die. Her pain heated her whole body, and she trembled in fear. Still, Sylvia didn't run away. How long she would last remained unknown, but she decided to at least hold out until her mana ran out. I will not lose. Perseverance being the key to victory was all too familiar to Sylvia, after all, since she lived day to day enduring it. Tick, tock, tick, calm down and remain on standby, everyone. Lucia took on the role of leading the debutantes in the classroom. All 49 of them had already warmed up and were now just waiting for the barrier to be completed. Tick, tock, tick. The clock's second hand ticked amid the silence, their heartbeat echoing with it as their hands trembled like leaves swaying against the winds. Lucia wiped her sweat from her forehead. Tick, tock, tick, the debutantes' breathing became rough. Those who had fragile psyches looked so serious they almost passed out. Don't lose your consciousness. If we don't do it right, just know that we won't have a nice life in the tower next semester. Everyone was forced to come back to their senses at Lucia's chirping cry. Tick, tock, tick, after a few more moments, the slowly moving second hand stopped. It was a fairing signal. Now, all of the debutantes, including Lucia, released their mana at the right timing. Wooong. They condensed all of it into their catalysts, Sylvia's necklace and Lucia's bracelet. Their heirlooms received mana from 49 different individuals and delivered all of it to the barrier's formula. Blue magic rushed like a firework. Wooosh. A light so bright it almost broke their retinas flashed, causing the classroom's interior to burn up like a supernova. Their mana was consumed in an instant, and the exhausted debutantes fell one by one. Ugh. Lucia endured with all her might, imbuing as much mana as she could into the catalysts, but it wasn't enough. There was a pain in the back of her neck as if it were cut off. Ugh. Her eyes clouded, and her body staggered. Eventually, she fell to the floor. In that state, she stared at the corner of the barrier. Its bright light had started fading away like a bonfire that had run out of wood to burn. She knew she shouldn't leave it like that, but her body wouldn't listen to her. Lucia could only blink at it. I can't. As her eyelids were about to close, she saw a familiar figure. The person looked down at her with a cold expression. D. Lane's assistant professor. Alan. In the next instant, their catalyst light burned once more this time more brilliantly than any other light source she had ever seen, as his mana rushed forward, blazing like the sun. The moment its formula was completed, a radiant flash devoured the entirety of their surroundings. A barrier had manifested. Mom! Why did my cat die? I loved and cherished him as hard as I could, but he still left my side. Why did he betray me when I loved him? Life has always been like that. He didn't betray you, Sylvia. 
he's leaving to go to a better place. In that distant country, he'll be waiting patiently for you. You're lying. How long will you be with me then, mom? Um I wonder tilde wa. Wow. Wow. Sorry. Don't cry tilde wa. Wow ah ah. I will stay with you as long as you want. Oh. Then. Then. Sylvia always wallowed in her dreams. The reality she wanted was not in the present but the future, after all. The present was just a stepping stone for it. She stayed up night after night reading magic books, even sacrificing her time for meals to avoid wasting even a second, or went to the floating island every week to find information. She didn't do those simply because she wanted to. She didn't do it because it was fun. Her mother left her side at an early age to go to the land of rainbows, where her cat waited. From the time her mother, the one who painted her life, disappeared, until now that she had become a wizard at the Imperial University Tower, the world had lacked color. It looked thick and opaque, like a crushed oil painting. For her, the present was a place she didn't want to stay for long. Sylvia often turned her clock's hands with her eyes tightly closed, hoping that once she opened them, she would be in the distant future where she'd be more mature and blunt, but above all, where her memories would hurt less. When I become an archmage and ascend to the skies, my mother will be able to see me. I'll make her proud of me. For her, the present was. Just a preparation period to make their picnic in the distant future more enjoyable. Whoosh. A lonely wind blew. The air currents that rushed into the sealed Imperial University Tower made Sylvia realize that the barrier had been activated. Gosh. Those guys did something useless. However, she had run out of mana, and Luina was still standing opposite of her. Sylvia placed her hand around her collarbone. The keepsake from her mother, who had always embraced her, wasn't there. Die. Luina released ashes. With no mana left to defend herself, Sylvia could only close her eyes in a hurry. The rushing ashes stopped right in front of her, but she didn't see it happen. She just stumbled and fell. Thud, something supported her before she could reach the floor, however. It felt as sturdy as a wall. Sylvia opened her eyes lightly, and though his face wasn't visible, he found his broad chest keeping her up. Sylvia. His voice alone was enough for Sylvia to determine who he was. She tilted her head up slightly. His eyes were looking at her. Don't worry. I won't let you fall. He said, displaying what looked like a faint smile. Sylvia wanted to say something to him, but her lips refused to move. She couldn't even wiggle her fingertips. Mana exhaustion had set in. You always repay my faith. I will now take over this responsibility as your professor. Sylvia leaned her entire weight against him. Smiling faintly, she closed her eyes and fell asleep clutching his collar. You can rest now. Chapter 67, Sorting Things Out, 1. Sylvia had fallen asleep. Fortunately, she was breathing normally. I put her in a safe place then looked at the enemy. Baron of the Ashes. He was glaring at me with distorted eyes, but he wasn't too threatening. Actually, Having parasitized McQueen's body was something I was grateful for. Idiot. Why did you swallow someone that didn't even fit you? He was incomplete. It seemed that he dominated about 70% of the vessel, but the remaining 30% was still under Lewina's control, all because he swallowed a named character that was too powerful. You already know, don't you? You cannot challenge me with that body. The contract that was entwined in Lewina's body still existed. Hence, he couldn't do any harm to me. This is the end for you, parasite. My voice sounded scornful, which made the bastard furious. His black pupil's savage stare grew darker. The very next moment, he made a move that even I hadn't expected. Whoosh. The Baron escaped from Luina's body, causing a stream of air engulfed in ashes to rise in all directions. It wrapped around me like a great storm, revealing a bizarre face within it. Right. I was stupid. The Baron of the Ashes said in mid-air, chuckling and laughing. But if it's you, then it would be different. He seeped into me, his particles being absorbed by my body. After a while, a harsh voice rang out from the bottom of my chest. How dare you call me a parasite? You don't even have anything special within you. It was a pretty unpleasant feeling. His essence touched my subconscious, digging up several of my memories and bringing them to the surface. I replied softly. I'll give time for you to think about your decision. You are but a common being. I can easily take control of you. 
I closed my eyes. Memories of the past, filled with demented malevolence and dark emotions, ran through my veins along with D. Cullain's pride. And during all of it, I asked quietly. Can you handle it? The Baron of the Ashes didn't answer. I could sense his bewilderment, however. I just smiled. Feelings of defeat, jealousy, envy, anger, hatred. Within me was pride that illusions or impulses could never sway. A cry like that is rather elegant, almost a classic. D. Cullain was by no means a self-defeating person. Ah! The Baron of Ashes struggled inside me to get out. I didn't let him. Baron! Tell me! Open! Open! Who's down there? I was curious. Who did the Baron of Ashes encounter under my consciousness? Was it Kim Woojin? Or was it D. Cullain? The Baron's scream slowly turned into that of a beast. He was smashed to pieces, swept away by D. Cullain's ego. Pay attention to whoever is inside me. Despite his struggle, my mind remained as calm as a lake. That pit of hell is your grave. Silence permeated my mind. He no longer existed. The Baron of the Ashes had been destroyed. I neither absorbed nor assimilated with him. He was simply crushed by the ego that filled me. TSK. Moron. A being that wasn't me couldn't exist in me. That's how D. Cullain was. I saw Lewina collapsed on the floor. The body that the Baron of Ashes had abandoned was asleep, exhausted. Lewina had a nightmare. She dreamed of being so jealous and filled with hatred for someone that she became a monster with a sense of inferiority and defeat. It was as if she became the very person she despised. There were days when Lewina was also inflated with her own talent, days when she was proud of her belief that she would resurrect the McQueen family. She had this passion that made her want to leave her mark in the world of magic. It made her want to become a magic professor respected by the Empire and desired to create her own school and light a lamp on the continent. However, it was all interrupted by one man. Luina opened her eyes. Looking around, she grabbed her aching temples. Ugh! The whole floor was covered in ashes, and everything around her was scorched as if a fire recently burned her vicinity. A plaque was buried somewhere near her. This is. 23rd floor, external Professor Lewina, only then did she realize it wasn't a dream. As he ruled her, he brought forth vague memories of what she had to go through before. Lewina von Schlott McQueen. A voice called her. Surprised, Louisa looked back, finding the very predator of her family. D. Cullain. His blue eyes stared at her, his gaze unbreaking, unwavering. This scenery is not a dream. This is what you did with that guy. Yes. I know. Luina bowed her head and sighed. I know everything. Now, her mind and body were exhausted. She had no desire anymore. She was just at a loss. She regretted it. Should she have bowed her head from the beginning? Should she have resisted? If she had followed him like any other wizard, she wouldn't have gone through this. I have no intention of running away. I'll turn myself in. It's my fault. Luina said weakly, wiping her tears. That was the best option she could make in this situation. No. However, D. Cullain shook his head. He looked down at her as if he found her pathetic. That's not in the contract. Do you enjoy breaking promises? If that's the case, then you have a very disgusting temperament. Luina got furious. What the hell am I supposed to? Remember what I said. D. Cullain cut off her words. As her breath grew shaky, he continued to talk. You must become the head professor. No. He closed his eyes and corrected himself. You will become the head professor. No matter what happens. In this situation, is this your fault? Then, D. Cullain grinned. It was a mockery that was close to humiliation. However, its target wasn't Luina. Of course, I can't say your hands are clean of this incident, but as you may well know, blaming yourself won't change the world. Even if tears come out of your eyes, it wouldn't truly care. It wouldn't even acknowledge them. The sorrows they carried would simply be forgotten. But if you say it's not your fault, it's not your fault. Luina couldn't understand what he meant. I will make it so. Tap, tap. D. Cullain walked towards her. His shoes stopped near her, almost touching her knees. Luina. As he called her name, she looked up. Euclid never abandons someone it chose to embrace. He reached out to her, 
who had fallen into disrepair. If you hold my hand. His blue eyes reflected her, allowing her to see how dirty she was, which brought her infinite embarrassment. But De Calaine didn't care. I will never abandon you. His pristine gloves wanted her ash-covered hands. This is the grace of the Eucline. Whoosh. The dawn broke from beyond the sky exposed by the tower's window, a ray of light lighting up the darkness around them. Silently, Luina grabbed his hand. Her instincts made her hand move on its own. De Calaine nodded as he helped her stand up. Luina looked at him after as he turned around and walked amid the ashes, causing them to spread like a mist. Their particles mixed with the wind and were blown away. Even in the middle of it all, he remained untouched by dirt as he left. A small question appeared in Luina's mind as she watched him. When did that man's back become so wide? Has he been working hard all this time? Gosh! Thinking she was being ridiculous, Luina just laughed. The day after the so-called terror of the ashes, the tower was still littered with the parasites. Ha ha ha! That's right. Yes, yes. D. Cullane grew busy due to the prestigious Jefferson family's sudden visit. They were known to have made a career as the production directors of the Legal Affairs Bureau and the Internal Affairs Bureau from generation to generation. Their grandfather also served as a minister. As expected from you, Professor. Oh, of course. I have no doubts about this report. Luina is, after all, a kind-hearted person. Oh, by the way, this one is Viscount Darren. It is an honor to meet you. I'm Lopez Darren, currently serving as the Deputy Director of the Legal Affairs Bureau. He's a very talented friend. Also, I know this is rude of me, but this one's also your fan, so let me introduce you. Oh my you didn't have to tilde. Jefferson and Lopez accepted a small gift from the professor. Obviously a sign of sincerity. Nothing against the law. The two smiled happily and soon heard his main point. At Lopez's residence, the deputy director of justice made a call after meeting with the professor. Oh, how are you? It's nothing important. I have someone to introduce to you. Be careful. Come quietly. Deputy Director Lopez gathered some people to help him with his light work using a crystal ball. He then smiled contentedly. Ha ha ha. To think that I got to meet the professor like this. Is this a revelation from God that the position of director is imminent? I'm really lucky these days. It is an honor, Professor. I'm Jerome, the head of the Human Resources Department at the Legal Affairs Bureau. I'm Alberg, Deputy Director of the Department of Home Affairs. Ha ha. Everyone, sit down. You're making the professor uncomfortable. A meeting was arranged by Lopez. Jerome and Alberg bowed deeply and sat. To them, an unknown professor handed over a report. Well, this is it. Yes. Naturally, rumors are already circulating. Once the trial is held, it will end without any problems. But for some reason, the professor didn't seem to like even the notion of having a trial. Jerome and Alberg hastily corrected it. That's right. We, too, want to do what the professor wants. But there are a few problems. We'll talk to the police on our own. Alberg, Jerome, Lopez, Jefferson. The four bureaucrats visited the office of Lilia Premien, the deputy director of the Public Security Bureau. Deputy Director Premien. There's something I'd like to tell you. We have nothing to talk about. Leave. Hey, Deputy Director. At least listen to what we have to say. Premien looked like she was looking at some scum, but her expression changed little by little as she listened to them. If you refuse, the professor will come to you directly. That professor is a hard person to deal with, even for you. Don't you also have some debts to repay? Contemplating, she nodded. I had made all the preparations, but I met a reef in an unexpected place. Jefferson made a cautious call with the crystal ball. Yes. Sorry. There was one problem. These days, some officials are needlessly burning a sense of justice. I am from the law office. He's got talent, but he's really cheeky. This report also needs a thorough investigation. You don't have to take a step forward on your own. Well soon. Oh, yes. Sorry. His name is Joseph. Joseph was a senior official of the court. He was a child of some lowly nobleman and had a status close to a commoner's, 
but he became the youngest to pass the legal exams and became a court official with his unique intelligence. However, he didn't have any friends with whom he communicated. Compared to his abilities, his web of connections was poor. Someone like you in such a shabby place. A university professor visited his small house today. He was far from ordinary, and the thought of meeting him alone was already extremely intimidating in itself. Sit down. He acted as if he were the owner of the house. Joseph accepted his master-like attitude very naturally. He presented a report as soon as he did as instructed. This is a report on the ashes of the tower. I see. Joseph gave the contents with a quick glance. I've already read it. Still, it would be absurd to say that the suspect, Luina, was not at all at fault. A more fair analysis would be. Wren. The professor beckoned to the attendant standing behind him. Wren took a step closer and placed a long, luxurious box on the wooden desk, covering the scratches and dents on its surface. Frowning, Joseph asked, is that a bribe? For a moment, the professor's expression hardened. He took a deep breath and crossed his legs, those series of gestures putting pressure on his prey. You're pretty rude. I am just being honest. You should distinguish between being straightforward and being honest, shouldn't you? Joseph bowed his head silently, his shoulders trembling involuntarily. It was an animal-like instinct. He was rumored to be upright in court, but it was strangely difficult to meet this professor's eyes. I apologize. But what is this if not a bribe? An opportunity. An opportunity? Right. A chance to be one of my people. The professor tapped the report. I wonder if your attitude to look into this report is the problem. No. A more definitive investigation is needed. The on-site investigation was not fair, and most importantly, Professor Luina wasn't even interrogated. To be so fair. The professor cut him off. You shouldn't have made a family. Joseph's eyes widened. The professor buried himself in the chair without expression as his twisted gaze glared at him. I heard your son just turned six. So, is love fun? Joseph said nothing. His breathing grew rougher. Does a righteous man like you love your children, your wife, and others equally? Involuntarily, he looked at the door to his bedroom, where his wife and children were waiting. The professor continued. I know. You are different and fair, unlike other rotten officials. So, I'll say it again. This is an opportunity, not a bribe. His eyes scanned him up and down, his clenched fists standing out. You will know. Justice that starts from below is of no use. His mouth remained firmly shut, but he could read everything from the wrinkles on his face. Then, see you next time. The professor stood up. Joseph's wife and child, who heard it, went out and bid him farewell. Giving them a faint smile, he walked out of the house. After that, he got into the car parked outside. Did he take it? D. Cullain waited for a while before asking Wren that question. Wren closed his eyes and nodded, his five senses peering into Joseph's house. Yes. He's opened the box, and his wife saw its contents. Ah, then he'll accept it. People like him would never accept money. No, even if he did, he wouldn't use it. Hence, he gave the child a gift instead. Imperial Academy admission ticket, lifetime Imperial Academy scholarship, the two of them are arguing right now. Don't you know what it's like to enter the Imperial Academy? It's a place where we can't go even if we have money. Let me think about it. What is there to think about? Our child can be there too. It seems it's only a matter of time. Okay. D. Cullain nodded. If it wasn't money or jewelry, people found it surprisingly easy to accept gifts, especially if it was a privilege related to children. This was my way of covering the case while also making connections. Joseph was an accidentally found treasure. The brilliance of the, man of great wealth, that he gave off was quite special. Let's go. As you wish. The vehicle started smoothly and moved according to Wren's driving. There was no trial that I was worried about. The Justice Bureau, the Home Affairs Bureau, and the Public Security Bureau stamped, investigation complete, on the report written by D. Cullain, his subordinate professor, and a debutante, and all relevant witnesses took a stance favorable to Luina. It ended with the action of a parasitic spirit called the Baron of Ashes. Imperial magic instructor eliminated the incident at the university tower has been amended, but an impeccable mental power is also included in the qualifications of the emperor's magic educator. 
Hence, Louina von Schlott McQueen has been stripped of her position. This entire predicament only cost her her magic educator position and a sincere apology to the debutantes who suffered because of her. Of course, the fact that there were no fatalities was a major factor. Ha ha. Louina laughed bitterly and looked up at her own office. 47th floor, Professor Louina's office. Somehow, after fighting to the end with the Baron of the Ashes and eventually being swallowed up, she became a do-it-yourself professor, and her office rose 25 floors. So this is politics. It was probably thanks to D. Cullain. Indeed, its magnificence was admirable. Hmm. Louina looked around the 47th floor. It was a much more spacious and neat office compared to the one on the 23rd floor. She sat behind her desk and grabbed a fountain pen to reply to the letter of the imperial family. Thinking about how to begin, she suddenly came across the perfect opening. Five years. Five years came to mind. Why? It was a clause in their contract that had been questionable from the time it was created. Five years. Why was it not one year, not ten years, not a lifetime, but five years? He stayed home for a week. Louina engrossed herself in her writing. Dika Lane staying at home was a pretty unusual event, so Louina knew about that too. According to many rumors, he has changed since then. If so, were there any shocking events during that week? No, even if it's not shocking, what transpired throughout that duration? She grew genuinely curious. What kind of incident caused that obsessive Dika Lane to take multiple leaves, ignoring all his schedules for a week? At that moment, a single word flashed through Louina's mind. No way? Deadline? She tapped the word scribbled on the paper with the fountain pen in her hand. If it was an incurable disease, the period of five years was reasonable. That would also open up the probability of a person's personality suddenly changing. Anyone. If their death wasn't far away. No. That's nonsense. Louina laughed and put the paper in the drawer. Chapter 68, Sorting Things Out. 2. Pitter patter. Snow fell from the skies, forming a thick layer of it on the ground as they accumulated, covering her vicinity entirely in white. Pitter patter. Winter here was eternal. The snow that fell never melted either. Regardless, she waited. Would this coldness melt away in the distant future? If she waited and held on until the snow became water for the land, would it ever sprout? No, she doubted it. It was no different from her situation. She often found herself wondering if spring would ever come to her. Julie's life began with death. She gained life at the price of her mother's, after all. That was the first ever sin she committed when she was born into this world. Wow. Freyden's resistance was always held in gelid winter. The small child stared blankly at the knight's swordsmanship in the pure white hall. The knights brandished their swords as they sweated, but among them, her father and brother were the best. She was proud of them. They were beautiful. It looked like a play from a distance, and from close up, it looked like a dance. At that moment, her older brother, finishing his match, looked back at her, sweat dripping from him suddenly freezing like jewels. Ah, um. Er. Julie avoided his gaze. Sight never spoke to Julie first. Everyone in their family was like that. Even though there was nothing wrong with her, they always drew an invisible line. Julie. However, that day was an exception. Her elder brother looked at her with a melancholic smile for reasons she couldn't decipher. Young Julie faced him with wide open eyes. Why 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 yes, brother? Would you like to wield a sword too? Yes? Her dream of being a knight was etched deep in her heart from then on. Knights served their masters. They became the swords that cut every enemy before them. They protected their subjects and the country while staying true to their beliefs. There was no room for her in it. Yet, despite taking away her mother from her family, despite her existence itself being a sin, she still dreamed of it, no matter how long and distant it was. Julie opened her eyes. The morning sky was dark, and there was a throbbing pain in her heart. Knock, knock. Hearing a knock on the door, Julie got up from her bed. The aching pain spread all over her body, but with a little patience, she knew it'd go away. Your bath is ready. The servant outside said. Okay. Julie entered the bathroom and looked at the mirror blankly. Staring at herself, she remembered her promise to him. If you can't become the guardian knight within that time, 
we might have to get married after all. So, don't get stuck in one place. Now, there wasn't much time left. Defilum Forest near Haiti Cane on the western part of the empire. Side quest, support for demon purification. Store currency plus two. These days, the concentration of mana had increased in some areas, causing demon-related monsters such as gargoyles to appear. Today, I was tasked to suppress and purify one of those locations as part of a quest requested by the cathedral and accepted by the tower. Hmm. Initially, I smashed all the beasts and foes that got in my way and moved forward, but at some point, I found an area dotted with death variables, covering it with the most vivid red I had ever seen. My intuition told me that if I went in there, my death would be inevitable. The danger it posed was far from ordinary. The villain's fate, worked according to my skills. A trap prepared by just a few goblins wouldn't even get caught by its radar. But this forest was far from the threat such low-class monsters could pose against me. On the other side, an enemy that I couldn't overcome was lurking. Hmm. Of course, if my opponent were a demon, I would grow stronger. However, there was a limit to that since the concentration of mana here was too thin. This forest wasn't as rich in mana as the Krebus Canyon or the Devil's Barrier. What's going on, Professor? A blonde priest asked, following my lead. Terpy, I stood still and searched for a suitable excuse to run away without looking scared. Let's go back. I turned around without saying a word, causing Terpy to look perplexed. But we haven't even reached the source yet. We've done enough scouting and analysis. Let's do the rest next time. You must always prepare ahead of time for anything to avoid being in danger. I calmly spoke as I walked. We can finish it quickly, but I want to teach you the method of getting rid of demons cautiously. Terpy nodded. After about 30 minutes, we finally reached the forest entrance, where Uriel and my vassals were waiting. Her puffed cheeks displayed her anger. Are you done? Uriel asked. Terpy shook his head. We just scouted ahead today and decided to finish the task at hand later. She quickly turned her head and glared at me upon hearing his reply. Ignoring her, I got into the car. Terpy bowed. Thank you for your hard work, Uriel. You're welcome, priest. Thank you as well. Uriel also got in quickly. As soon as she took a seat, she yelled, Why? Why couldn't I? Be quiet. You didn't even make it to the end. It wouldn't have been dangerous. The eldest daughter of the Euclid family and the deputy lord of Hadecane wanted to accompany me for today's purification. However, I had no intention of putting her on the battlefield. You'd only be a hindrance. I'm also a Euclid, you know? I'm stronger against demonic entities. That wasn't true. Euclid blood didn't flow in her veins. Don't be stupid. The ones in charge don't stay on the front lines. In the future, if you ever step into any war zone, I'll assume our promise doesn't exist in the first place. You've been warned. Uriel's expression hardened. Are you serious? She looked at me while grinding her teeth. You've been pretending to be a great brother lately, but today, you decided to humiliate me in front of our vassals. How will I be able to look at them now? Uriel was really looking forward to this day. To assert her legitimacy to our subjects, she even brought it was also happening near the territory of Euclid, so she probably felt a sense of responsibility. Regardless, I ignored her wishes. I didn't allow her to follow, causing her to feel shame in front of our villains. Uriel. What? Uriel. What? My face hardened. Uriel. Gosh, what is it? Sir? Uriel pouted, her voice trembling. However, this time, I couldn't back down. Stop acting like a child. Don't be stubborn. Everything I was doing was for her. Don't make a scene. You should know better without me having to point out your behavior. How long do you plan to act like a child? Uriel knew the traditions of the Euclid family. Perhaps the reason for her current actions was to prove to the vassals that the tradition had been passed on to her. Act according to your position. Show the dignity our estate deserves. Uriel didn't answer, leaning silently against the window instead. Her hair obscured her face, but she looked like she was about to cry. Her tiny shoulders were shaking, and her breathing was ragged. Let's go to the Isle of Wizard's Wealth. I have work to do today. I didn't talk to Uriel. Defilum Forest. Did he leave? Did he leave? Asked Garrick, 
sharpening his dagger while holding his breath amid the long coniferous woods. He was a handsome man with his long black hair tied behind his back and was nicknamed multi-personality, which didn't suit him. Did he really leave? Yes. He did. Arlos nodded. Garrick asked again. Did he leave? For real? Yes. Really? I said he did, son of a bitch. Oh no way Tilda. Only when she cursed did he seem convinced. Like this, each of the ashes had a screw loosened. Did he notice? Yeah, you moron. How could he not? You radiated so much murderous aura. D. Cullane's a coward, huh? I did it to lure him in. Arlos just smiled. She actually seemed to understand why D. Cullane avoided Garrick. His voice played in her head. You don't avoid excrements because you're afraid of it, but because they're disgusting and dirty. That was what he most likely thought. Man this is annoying. Ah Tilda. Garrick groaned and slammed the back of his head against a tree. Do you even have any reason to aim for D. Cullane? Huh? You want to kill him just because he's famous, right? Garrick naively tilted his head. He then giggled. Well, there's more to it than that. I have a huge grudge against the Euclid family. They submerged our village, after all. He tapped his forehead with his finger. As you probably already know, even at this moment, there are a lot of people talking in my head. All of them are members of my family who died then. The pathology of his multiple personalities was ultimately due to the Euclid family. If so, then he had a pretty good reason. What about you, Arlos? Garrick then asked. I don't. In fact, I have no intention of killing him. Of course, there was that incident with him, but she held no grudge against him. D. Cullane was like a beehive. His destruction would cause bigger problems. Hence, she rejected the notion of turning the entire Euclid family into an enemy. Why? Didn't you say your parents were also wizards, Arlos? Maybe they had a grudge against them? Shut up. Her parents died before she was even three years old. She didn't know why, and she didn't want to know. Who knows? D. Cullane might have killed them. He was just a child back then. Stop spouting nonsense and shut up. I mean... Arlos grabbed Garrick's collar and stared at him as if she was going to kill him. If you keep talking like that, I will tear up your insides and kill you. Oh, I'm sorry please understand I'm just pissed since D. Cullane suddenly flew off. If you understand, then begin preparing it. She let go of his neck. Their goal wasn't to ambush D. Cullane in the first place. They just happened to have a mission to carry out around the same area. However, accidentally hearing the news that D. Cullane was coming, the guys who were currently teaming up with Arlos, including Garrick and Glipper, got excited. Anyway, I will definitely kill D. Cullane. Garrick laughed softly and leaned against a tree. My family is hoping for that. Right, brother? Yes, brother. They are. You know how painful it was when I drowned. Yeah. I do. Father also said. Ignoring the bizarre conversation he had with himself, Arlos read the newspaper. Symposium problem number six, will it finally be solved by head professor D. Cullane? The place of proof. Red Garnet Adventure Team's tertiary settlement, the principality of Urun. Now. Read it, everyone. Inside the house she was staying in with the children, Ganesha opened the adventurer exam pamphlet. Get ready for the 133rd adventurer's test. The adventurer's guild awaits talented challengers. On page 37. A Q&A with Guildmaster Go Whole. Are you curious about the ranking of adventurers these days? Check out page 47. Carlos, Leo, and Leah read its contents while eating ice cream. While looking at their faces, Ganesha noticed Leah's increase in height. Wow. Leah's growing up quickly. Your skeletal structure is definitely perfect for adventurers. Not too thick, but not too fragile either. You have a very strong body. She touched Leah's body all over, causing her to feel ticklish and to push her away. Ah, ha ha. Stop, ha 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 ha, I think you'll be taller than Rayleigh in three more months. Damn. Why drag me into your conversation? Rayleigh, an adventurer eating chips on the couch, clicked her tongue. She turned her attention to the two other children. Carlos, Leo. You guys are growing a bit slower, huh? Leah is already 160 centimeters. What are you guys doing? Their faces scrunched up, their pride seemingly hurt. 
Leah is two years older than us. That's why she's growing faster. That's true. In the end, you'll get bigger. It's all genes. How are the Freighton these days, Rayleigh? Ganesha asked. Julie's cousin, Rayleigh, was no different from an imperial informant. Almost all rumors reached her ears. She shrugged. I don't know. There's no news about them these days. Then again, Knight Julie seems to have reconciled with her fiancé. She reconciled with Professor D. Cullane? Yes. They're not fighting, at least. What? Ganesha's eyes widened. However, as she was about to ask a pretty stupid question, Leah suddenly screamed at the top of her lungs. The two of them are reconciling? Ganesha and Rayleigh both looked at her at the same time, finding her looking as if a hammer just hit the back of her head. Rayleigh chuckled. Now that she had started reading newspapers these days, she seemed to have grown interested in these rumors. Yeah. That's what rumor says. Why? No way. What do you mean? It can't be. However, her reaction was much more turbulent than expected. It couldn't be, how, why, no. She mumbled those words incomprehensibly, then ran back to her room. What? What's wrong with her? Did she eat something wrong? The two grown-ups just smirked. Nice then we'll get her ice cream too. The moment Carlos and Leo were about to steal her dessert, Leah's door opened. Put it down, you idiots. Give it to me. That's mine. She charged in and headed back into her room after retrieving it. The Grand Hall on the fifth floor of Medjison had been designated as the place of proof of the symposium question number six's resolution presented by D. Cullane. The event, which would make or break his thesis, was held in such a magnificent place. Wow! 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 A fairy was lucky enough to be one of the few that could attend it. There were a lot of famous wizards around her. The jury alone was composed of two ethereal ranked mages. Rogeriu and Jindaf. There were also Lewina, Becca, and I Helm. Even Her Majesty's younger brother, Crato, was present. Why is he seated next to a cat? In the seat next to him, a peculiar red feline was lying and yawning. It's cute. Be quiet, Eferin. You're embarrassing. Sylvia said. Eferin stared at her. Their tickets were their reward for their contribution in solving the Baron of Ashes case. Huh? Hey! You're a fairing, right? At that moment, they heard a voice familiar to a fairing. The two debutantes both tracked down its source. Oh? Aren't you the professor's younger sister? Their eyes landed on Uriel, whom she met by chance before. Uriel smiled. Yup. Long time no see. Thanks to you, I got a penalty point. A fairing's cheeks puffed. Uriel simply shrugged. Really? I'm sorry. I got caught too, you know. How about we call it even? That, uck. Hello. Sylvia pushed a fairing away. Giving her a soft smile, she greeted Uriel politely. Nice to meet you. I am Sylvia. A gentle yet polite introduction. Uriel nodded awkwardly. Yeah. I know. You are Sylvia of Iliade. Yes. Sylvia's eyes, looking at Uriel, moved and gazed somewhere else. A fairing did the same. Ha! Huh. She stood out above all else. Setting aside her white hair, eyes, and beautiful appearance, she was the only knight in a place filled with wizards. D. Cullane's fiancé, Julie. She received a special invitation. Wearing a robe over her light armor, she delightfully approached Uriel upon finding her. How have you been, Uriel? Hello. She twisted her lip upward. Julie seemed to be preparing to say something, but Uriel turned her head as if she didn't want to talk to her. Hence, she just smiled bitterly and sat down. We will now turn off the lights. The room dimmed not long after. The place of proof of the symposium's sixth question, which has remained unanswered for fifteen years, shall now begin. Although not as vast as its name suggested, the Grand Hall was the most honorable place to discuss magical science. The curtain fell on the podium on the other side. Sigh. Eferin looked at Sylvia, who seemed tense. What are you doing? She was acting weird. When she didn't answer, she followed her laser-like gaze, finding a white-haired person. Julie. Chapter 69, Sorting Things Out, 3, 30 minutes ago. 
Symposium Evaluators Waiting Room. Luina Uni. Is this answer real? The ethereal ranked wizard, Rose Rio, asked out of suspicion. Luina shrugged. What do you mean? Did D. Lane really write this answer? Rose Rio was an ethereal level mage with impressive short pink hair, but she was actually younger than her, hence why she called Luina Uni. She was a support and healing genius who only stayed in the magic tower for six months, climbed up to the Isle of Wizards' wealth afterward, and reached the ethereal rank at 25 years old. Yeah. D. Lane wrote it himself. Rose Rio still couldn't believe it. Jindaf, sitting quietly in another chair, asked, Really? I'm suspicious of D. Lane's nature. I know his situation, after all. Jindaf, who was now in his 70s, was the personification of old wizards in fairy tales. He wore round glasses and had long gray hair and a beard. No, this bothers me more than that. Rose Rio pointed to the last part of D. Lane's theorem. In addition, 48 runes were successfully interpreted and organized, but they were not published since they didn't fit the topic. Is this for real? He said he interpreted several runes? That's got to be a lie. Luina laughed bitterly. I already took a look at his interpretation paper. I even saw it recited. D. Lane had shown her some of the rune interpretation paper. Of course, they might think he was wrong, but it was surprisingly easy to tell whether it was correct or not. He had to memorize the pronunciation. The runic language itself was imbued with magic, so just speaking it correctly would consume mana. That guy, Dika Lane, has linguistic talent. I heard he speaks ten languages. Ha, huh, really? I can't bring myself to believe that. Rose Rio's eyes remained squinted as Jindaf chuckled, stroking his beard. Rose, feel free to think about it as you deem fitting Tilda. In fact, runes weren't even her current priority. The five-year period D. Lane demanded was still stuck in her head. It can't be, right? There isn't a disease that can't be cured even with U. Klein's financial and political power. Even after repeating that in her mind, she couldn't think of any other way to explain it. I promised, didn't I? Five years. You will not be my stumbling block, and I will not be your stumbling block. Why did he promise five years? Aren't you four years younger than me? You still can grow a lot so time is definitely on your side. Why did he say that? It doesn't make sense. Time was definitely on his side. If it were the usual arrogant D. Lane, no, even if it weren't, he wouldn't say things like time is on your side while solving the symposium problem. The honor and feat of interpreting the runes would shine brighter as time went by. Luina soon shook her head, however. Phew. What does it matter? Whenever she remembered all that D. Lane did to her in the past, her body still trembled. Deep inside, her hatred for him continued to burn like embers. However, no matter if she liked it or not, Luina was a thorough wizard. She was accustomed to the law of the jungle and was an extremely rational animal. Therefore, rather than burning with passion, she calmly set herself up to achieve her true goal. The McQueen's Magic Vision. The title of head professor. She didn't care about anything else other than that. She would willingly bury the humiliation, personal feelings, and family resentment she suffered from him for those objectives. Besides, as D. Lane, she'd be free in five years anyway. Is he going to release this 48 runes interpretations today as well? Rose Rio asked. Before Luina could answer, she continued with a sigh. In any case, let's head out now. She created wind and rolled the curtains in the waiting room. Behind it stood the short chairman like a statue. Ah ha ha! Receiving Rose Rio and Jindaf's gazes, she laughed and, clenching her fists, asked, D. Lane has the interpretation of 48 runes? Did he really interpret 48 runes? Is he going to reveal it today? It'll be a mess. You'll have to ask him since he's the only one who can answer that, Chairman. No. This is not the time. The Chairman's eyes filled up with mischief, her expression screaming, I'm going to spread the word right away. Watching the Chairman run away, Rose Rio burst out laughing. That uni doesn't change your accent is still noticeable. Me? What do you mean? I'm speaking using the standard accent. Rose Rio's hometown was Rococo, which was on the outskirts of the empire. It was a rural area famous for its strong accent. Actually, yours isn't that strong. When I first went to Rococo, I thought I was in a different country what? Wow, 
your regionalism is too strong. I didn't think you were this type. For your information, it's not that different. Say bullfight. Bullfight. Rose Rio stayed quiet. The capacity of the Grand Hall was 400 people. Although it was small for its awe-inspiring name, it was still more than good enough to prove the solution of the symposium. Actually, the word grand in its name itself wasn't wrong. About 300 years ago, when the designer and archmage of the Isle of Wizards Wealth, Low Plan, built the Medicine, this was the widest hall. It had become the place of culture and tradition since the beginning of the floating island. How? H. H. How? Perhaps that was why Alan was now showing symptoms of anxiety disorder. Calm down. Yes, yes, yes. He couldn't stay still even while in his seat. He clenched his left hand around his trembling right hand, causing the tremor to spread throughout his body. Like some kind of gym nerd. Seeing him like that, I felt like Alan was impressive. His original personality was nothing like that. His acting was very natural. Phew. 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 Hick. No, Hick. This is going to be a problem. Why am I getting hiccups now? I silently looked at my, rune interpretation summary, a compilation of the 48 different rune interpretations in addition to the 14 runes that had been interpreted in the magical world. I thought about making it public, but I decided against it since it was impossible to predict what kind of impact that would make. It would be better to keep it in my head for now. Misuse of it could lead to an atomic bomb level disaster like the Manhattan Project, after all. BFFF. But it was really weird. When I looked at this font, I smiled involuntarily. Maybe it was because it reminded me of a voice, almost like I was experiencing a hallucination. Kim Woojin. Look at this. Memories of the past played back like a faded film. It's a rune that is being conceived by the setting team. Did they mix Hebrew and Latin? She put her hands together under her chin as she acted as cute as usual. Now, Woojin, you just need to clean it up. Try other fonts too. Make it look a little old. While talking about its setting, her gaze on me felt sincere and clear. Woojin, you look handsome when you are concentrating. Her name was Yuli. Hmm. Kim Woojin's memories remained in me. What? If that's the case, I'm way out of your league. However, her voice gradually faded. Was it because time had passed? It felt like I could forget about her now. Burr. Alan's vibrating sound brought me to reality. What was he, an alarm clock? Alan. What about the slab of stone? H here. It's here. Alan handed me the slate. It was a type of intermediary in which a large mana stone was processed into a slab and then engraved with runes. Knock, knock. Finally, the knock came, indicating that the time had come. Let's go. Alan got up, trembling, and went out of the waiting room with me. Follow me. We followed the guide and stood on the stage of the hall with the curtains lowered. It will start soon. There's only two of you? Yes. Why why yes. Behind me was a large blackboard and chalk. The hall was 30 years old, so its fixtures had a classic feel to them. Professor D. Cullane of the Imperial University Magic Tower will now defend his answer to symposium question number 6. The voice of the moderator resonated in the hall. As expected from the Isle of Wizards' wealth, not a single noise could be heard. Swoosh. Beyond the opening curtains was the Grand Hall's audience area, which had been filled to maximum capacity. Nevertheless, I immediately noticed one person. Julie. I could find her instantly, no matter where she was or what kind of crowd she was buried in. It was due to the affection that became part of my nature. The judges for today's proof were ethereal-ranked Rose Rio and Jindaf, monarch-ranked Luina, and Austal, an addict. I wasn't nervous at all. As I once said, the attention and stares that were pouring on me felt rather proper. Such was the effect of very natural elitism. Nice to meet you, I said calmly. I'm head professor D. Lane. I will now begin discussing my answer for Symposium Problem 6, Proof of Runes. D. Lane's theorem was carried out step by step, and the Grand Hall watched him in a quiet atmosphere. A document titled D. Cullane's Theorem was distributed to all attendees. If I were to interpret the inscription in question 6, that is, the runes, the following sentences are revealed. Where there is light and will, there is God. God hid out of fear of human worship. About half of the interpretation of this inscription had already been achieved by Rowden, 
a monarch-ranked wizard, along with a linguist Frange, leaving nothing special about my discussion regarding it. However, pass that was where my main point began. Get rid of the second sentence here. It's useless. De Cullain boldly deleted the second sentence. Only the three runes corresponding to light, will, and God in the first sentence serve as a magic circuit, and the rest are just materials for combination. Where there is light and will, there is God. Theta, Phi, Zeta. The first sentence hovered in the air. Although the runic language seemed to reject the interpretation itself, I insisted on it. The first step in deciphering these runes is segmentation. De Cullain shredded the runes. The entire sentence scattered in the air, forming several pieces. The first sentence has a total of 13 syllables, but there are 45 segments in those 13 syllables as well. It was similar to how the syllable Hib was segmented into three phonemes, H, I, and B. Runes were still languages, after all. But the number of combinations of these 45 segments is nearly innumerable, reaching at least 3,923,023,104,000, possibly more. 3,923,023,104,000 or more. But there is a second process in that number. It's about discovering and identifying the most meaningful rune combinations among them. The process is as follows. From then on, de Cullain's theorem entered a field that ordinary people couldn't understand. For almost two hours, countless combinations of runes unfolded like waves, which then turned into a certain shape, forming a magic formula. It was a job that required a lot of effort and time. That was the result of breaking through a certain limit after combining, understanding, with the setting knowledge in the head of game designer Kim Woojin. Now, take a close look at this. If he summarized all of the above in two sentences. The runes were disassembled, and a magic circle was created from that combination. However, it's very different from the standard magic circle of modern times. Rose Rio asked, is that combination certain? If the number of branches is that large, other combinations are also possible, aren't they? Her voice had a strong accent. Runes can be considered the magic of language itself. Think of it as a proverb that gives strength to your voice. She was becoming a bit bothersome, but de Cullain continued talking without showing any emotion. I only selected combinations that are easy for humans to pronounce because they are oral rather than abdominal, peritoneal, and cerebral. More than the difficulty of pronouncing the standard language for Rose Rio, there were clearly structures that humans couldn't even voice out. De Cullain dug into that point. Hmm. Rose Rio was convinced, and de Cullain gestured at Alan through a glance. Alan ran and handed him the magic slab. De Cullain placed his hand on it. Now, let me demonstrate the answer. At that moment, a quiet heat dawned upon the stillness of the Grand Hall. Excitement engulfed everyone's eyes. De Cullain closed his eyes. In that state, he carefully repeated the process demonstrated today. He disassembled the runes, summarized the rune combination formula, reconstructed the combination into a magic circle, and finally, he mumbled an unknown rune. Where there was light and will, there was God. Through that single sentence. Whoosh! A blue light rose from the slab. The wind blew as an apparition appeared, filling the grand hall with unidentified scenery. It depicted the past where runes were very common. The scene moved slowly as if borrowing a human eye. The white marble floor, the beautiful statue, a priest kneeling in the middle of the temple. After a while, the priest opened his mouth, putting his hands together as if in prayer. A beautiful sound rang out, its gentleness spreading throughout the hall. Everyone closed their eyes to focus their attention on their ears. The divine tone itself, unfortunately, did not last long. It just burned like a match and then faded away. The sound that rang like a low tide was swept away by a high tide of silence. De Cullain then continued, this inscription was a hymn to the gods. It was magic that had already been lost and a fragment of the past known as the Age of the Gods. Some might mistake it for nothing but a hymn at first glance, but the archaeological value of its entirety was immense, and the ideas that came from that answer would lead to other magical inventions. The proof is over. De Cullain finished his theorem like that. The auditorium was quiet, the feeling of runes lingering around every person like drizzle. Judge Jin Daff asked. That's impressive. But is this the end? There is a paragraph at the end saying that other runes were interpreted and compiled into a summary. Jin Daff remained subtle, 
but Rose Rio decided to be upfront. D. Cullane understood what she meant, but he shook his head. I will not reveal the interpretation paper. Hmm. Do you refuse to reveal the interpretation paper? Or is it that you don't have it? Rose Rio asked. D. Cullane looked at her sternly and pulled out the documents from his inner pocket. This is the interpretation paper of 48 runes. This is the only original in the world, and I made no copies of it. Then the grand hall swelled with a small commotion. D. Cullane looked into the interpretation paper and muttered softly. The sound of runes echoed through the space around him. Most of his mana was consumed just by reciting three words, but it would be enough to prove its content. I interpreted many runes that remain unknown to the magical world. D. Cullane's words stopped abruptly, looking at the document he made. His expression seemed to wriggle with worry. Since they don't fit the topic and they can be misused if I were to reveal any more than this. In an instant, a fire broke out, its creator being D. Cullane, and transferred to the, rune interpretation summary, held in his hand. I will destroy it here. Flames engulfed the document, causing it to cry out with a strange sound. The runes written in it resonated with the magic. Just like that, the research that D. Cullane had been working on for about three years turned into ashes swept away by the wind. Oh? The Grand Hall grew speechless. The surprised wizard's mouth sank more heavily than any commotion, but D. Cullane, after cleaning the mess he left behind, only said, Now, let's start the Q&A. No one asked questions. Player, Yulia, Level, 7. Mana, 4507. Mana Rating, Rank 4, Talent Type, Origin. Attributes, 3. Personality, 7. Appearance, Blonde Red Eyes. Yulia was lying on an empty bed, contemplating her own identity. Blue letters fluttered in the air, displaying information about her character, including her levels and attributes under the category called Player. It was a system that only Leah could see. She didn't know why she came to this world. She knew neither the process nor the culprit of this phenomenon. She didn't even know their ultimate motive. There was no way she would, considering this phenomenon itself was far beyond science. As the lightning at night heated the entire company building, she closed her eyes once and then opened them. She just became a player in the game. It was something she had read in novels, but she didn't struggle like the main characters. Leah was, by nature, very adaptable and talented, and her appearance was the same as the original Yulia, although she was a bit prettier. Hence, it wasn't difficult for her to adjust to her new life. The problem was her age and starting point. She began at the The Archipelago Sea, which was far from the game's main quest. At 14 years old, she was 13 years younger than her actual age. Fortunately, her body had grown rapidly, and her unique survivability and spirit of improvement allowed her to reach mana rating level 4, but... Reconciliation? Nonsense. D. Cullane. She didn't know what kind of trickery it was, but the villain, whom she left alone since she couldn't react with her current body, reconciled with Julie. She still couldn't believe it. Leah bit her nails. Julie and D. Cullane had an irreconcilable relationship. Although they were opposites, her final puzzle was him. The game system itself was built that way. The core of Julie's story, a named character, was... In the end, D. Cullane. She suffered endlessly from D. Cullane, overcame her scars, and bloomed desperately as a flower of eternal winter. Hence, reconciliation could never happen. No, it was only when she had a conflict with D. Cullane that Julie would be able to overcome her own injury. Man. It's chaos beyond chaos. Of course, Leah had some doubts. Just as she became a player herself, wouldn't D. Cullane be a player as well? According to the novels she read, people from reality often possessed villains. No way. That was nonsensical. D. Cullane's actions, which Leah read in newspapers, were by no means at a level that the player could do. D. Cullane was too damn hard to play in the first place. T.S.K. But again, whenever she thought of D. Cullane, he reminded her of that guy. Kim Woojin, his role model. When she first heard that from the author, she was jealous, and there were many complaints about why they did it without Wujin's permission, but the D. Cullane she saw in the photo definitely resembled him. Of course, only in appearance. He must be fine. Leah laughed lightly. He was brittle, indecisive, and fragile, but that only showed how delicate and wounded he was. 
even though they broke up without being able to be together until the end, he remained by her side as her friend. But, at least, I wish you weren't here. No matter how much she missed him, this world didn't suit him. He was far too childish, so she thought she alone was enough for this kind of hardship. Even though I miss you sometimes. Leah looked out the window. Beyond that, the daily life of the Principality of Yurun was tumbling. Not bad. Day by day, Kim Woojin aside, she was getting farther away from D. Kalain, but she had the characteristic of being an adventurer. Adventurer. Rating, unique. Description, gains the qualities of a natural adventurer. The more one wanders the continent, the higher their growth rate. One's mana and stamina increase according to the number of areas they have explored. Thanks to this, her growth was rather steep, and above all, the princess named Maho lurked in Yurun. Her first goal was to get her quest from her. Sigh. After brushing her thoughts away, Leah looked around her, then moved and pulled out the wooden barrel she had hidden under her desk. When you're sad, look at the money box. Occasionally, she received pocket money from Ganesha or earned it by doing chores and errands secretly. After she crossed over from the archipelago to the continent, she earned about 5,000 illness per month, but unfortunately, she couldn't collect all of them. She sometimes lost her temper, wasting her illness on gummy candy and chocolate. Her character's personality was so childish. Regardless, although she had spent a lot of money, she had also saved quite a lot. Ha hoo hoo hoo. Leah took out the money box and looked at its contents. 10 bundles of 50 10 eln bills, a bundle of 50 100 eln bills, 3 silver coins, and 5 copper coins she found along the way. A total of 10,035 elness. 10 million Korean won. This is swelling up. Yes, yes, yes. First of all, after collecting 30,000 elness and investing in the redevelopment of Yurun, her savings would grow larger again through real estate and gambling. Giggle. Leah, who had been smiling slyly, suddenly looked innocent again, blinking emptily. Should I buy some sweets? I think it'll be fine since I have a lot of money. She blankly grabbed the three silver coins. Oh, no. But she immediately came to her senses and put it down. That occurrence always surprised her. It might be perhaps because of her personality, but whenever she was just a bit negligent, she recklessly pulled out and wasted money. Gather money watch it happily a lyle carelessness hey, I have a lot of money buying some sweets should be okay I'll grab chocolate and ice cream since I'm already here. That was the flow of her thoughts. That was especially the case with chocolate, a very expensive snack in this world. Knock, knock. She then heard sounds coming from outside her room. Leah immediately hit her money box. The Red Garnet Adventure Team had a lot of debt, so if they found her stash, they'd act like a mother stealing her children's New Year's allowance money while saying things like, I'll give it to you later, leave it to me Tilda who is it? Leah opened the door, speaking as brightly as possible. Chapter 70, The End of Semester, 1. Why did he burn it? I just can't seem to understand his actions. Wouldn't he have a meaning in his own way? Judges Rose Rio, Jin Daff, and the chairman were in the waiting room, having a discussion. Their topic was still D. Kalane's sudden action. The runes that D. Kalane muttered were three sentences, right? Does that mean he used a total of 18 runes? Did you clearly feel the surge of magic? Of course, 48 might be an exaggeration from D. Kalane, but the interpretation of 18 new runes was a sufficient achievement. D. Kalane burned that achievement himself. It was strange. The D. Kalane, known to Rose Rio, no, the magic world, became a fair wizard who didn't boast of his own research. Not empathic, but fair. Isn't it because he thought there would be a problem if the rune interpretation were revealed to the ashes? Rose Rio was taken aback by the chairman's unfiltered words. I mean, well, I heard those bastards had implanted spies even in the Isle of Wizards' wealth these days. I know. Those mean bastards. Because of them, the runes had to be burned. Ahem. Oh, yes. That's right, chairman. Your words are too precipitous. Among them amid a conversation, Luina kept to herself, deep in serious thoughts. Why did D. Kalane destroy his own research with his own hands? She reconstructed the case with her own wisdom and intelligence. Perhaps. Perhaps he was trying to find a cure or even just a clue to his disease in the runic language, hoping for an ancient power that transcended modern magic. However, 
he found no healing miracles in the rune language, unlike the possibility of misuse, which he found innumerable. Hence, he destroyed it on his own, without any regrets. No achievement would be able to give him any glory right now. At that moment. Slam. The door opened, and D. Kalain appeared. Startled, Rose Rio and the chairman immediately changed the subject of their conversation. D. Kalain looked at Jindaf among them. Elder Jindaf. Hmm? D. Kalain, did you just call me? Jindaf's wrinkled eyes became round. Yes. There's something I want to ask you. Me? Is it possible? It is, but. Jin Daff left with D. Kalane. Luina stared intently at the door the two of them just exited into. She wasn't a curiosity seeker, but she was so curious about this case her whole body was itching. The chairman looked at her and smiled. Professor Luina is just like me. Luina narrowed her eyes at her, finding the notion ridiculous. No. I'm different from you, chairman. How so? Luina leaned against the couch without a word. At that moment, the chairman's curiosity seeker antenna was activated. Relaxed back, pitiful eyes, finger movement, an expression that seemed to be in a little trouble. Her posture showcased the arrogance of dominating the information they didn't have. Her eyes twinkled, and the chairman clung to the seat next to Luina. What's different? Professor Luina Tilda? I don't know. Hey, don't do that. Unfortunately, Luina was tight-lipped. Achievement, Symposium Problem Solved. Mana plus 200. Store Currency plus 2. You want me to restore that? Yes. I held out a pendant to Jindaf. In it, there was a picture of a woman from the Luna family. The picture inside is important. Hmm. The picture looks a bit old, but it shouldn't be difficult. Jindaf was a named wizard who had reached the apex of the Harmony series which was why I decided to find him. However, there's something I want to ask you in return. Sure. I nodded, and at that moment, Jin Daff cast a spell on the picture. It was, regeneration, on a level I couldn't even begin to fathom. Did you truly interpret 48 runes? Of course. I laughed quietly. Jin Daff chuckled, stroking his beard and holding out the pendant. Here. Take it it had become nearly as good as new after his magic had finished restoring it. I opened it and looked at the picture inside. My eyebrows twitched. Jindaf asked, do you know that person? Yes. He was my assistant. Assistant? He committed suicide, I calmly said as I slipped it into my inner pocket. Jindaf scratched his cheek, pretending to be embarrassed. I'll repay. Don't talk nonsense. Witnessing your work today is enough. Jin Daff's personality remained the same as the setting. If I just listened to him, if I showed no sincerity, he wouldn't do me any favors in the future. I gave him a check. It's not much, but please accept it. 50,000 Elmas. It was a fair amount for his work. Jin Daff glanced at it with a squint and took the check with a benevolent smile. Why did you? I will use all of these to educate future students rather than on my own self-interest. I went out to the medicine's backyard. Credo, Uriel, Ifarin, and Sylvia were there, waiting, at the promised place. First, I bowed to Credo. Thank you for coming. Ha ha. It's nothing. Rather, it felt like you just opened my eyes. Your lectures are amazing. How did you come up with such an idea? That's why I called the wizard who walks the royal road. Oh, by the way. Credo covered his lips before continuing. Was there really only one original paper? Yes. There are no copies in this world anymore. Isn't that a waste? You've been immersed in it for a long time. I was thinking of destroying it from the beginning. This era isn't mature enough yet to use the rune language. Mature? Runes spoken by the mouths of the wicked are sure to turn into a weapon that'll cause death and destruction. Hence, I deemed it better to get rid of it. Kratos' jaw hung his eyes filled with a sense of respect that I found burdensome. Right, this is the book you asked for before. I pulled out a signed first edition, you Klein, understanding the pure elements, from my briefcase. Are you sure you want to give me something this precious? It's not even out in the market yet. Kratos' eyes twinkled as he looked at the book, his hand caressing its cover. I am giving it because it is precious. At that moment. What's your name? A fairing's voice sounded unusual. I looked around a little nervously. He he. 
You're cute. Your legs are so short. She was talking to a cat, who simply stared at her without a word. The red-furred munchkin was very cute on the outside, but knowing its true nature, I couldn't help but pray for her well-being. PFFFT. What? Why are you looking at me that way? Come on look at this tilde. A fairing took a foxtail and waved it in front of the cat, who then reached out to it. Its short paws moved along the grass that she shook. Although possessed, its body's innate instincts were still there. Oh. That's the cat the imperial family entrusted to me. Crato laughed softly. I realized then why Sophine was keeping her silence. Even her brother still didn't know the emperor was inside the feline. A fairing. Sylvia. I called out to them before things got complicated. You two did a great job in the recent Baron of Ashes case. I pulled out a checkbook from my inner pocket and handed them one by one. Consider this your reward. Regardless of price, buy what you want here in the Isle of Wizard's Wealth. Sylvia calmly nodded while a fairing looked like she was about to suffocate. Uriel, watching from behind them, was astonished. H. Hey, what are you guys going to buy with it? Rushing towards us, she pretended to ask such a question as she looked at the type of check I gave. Afterward, she whispered in my ear. Damn it. That's a family check. Use a goddamn personal check. This place didn't accept personal checks. Meanwhile, Julie was looking around the Isle of Wizards wealth alone. The pathways here are complicated. More accurately, she got lost. She was fine until she came out of the Grand Hall. When she came to her senses, she was already somewhere in the town. The most basic pathfinding tactic, just walk along the wall, did not work here. In some streets, the road itself rose to the sky, and in others, it fell straight down to the ground. Huh? Julie, who was wandering around the area, accidentally found a shop. Brand doll shop, a smile appeared on her lips. There was even a doll shop on this floating island. Approaching it, she saw a lot of cute stuffed toys on the shelf. Eagle, rabbit, and... Among them, she saw a small panda. Unlike other pandas, this one with brown eyes had been a famous panda brand since Julie was a child. Huh? However, the owner soon opened the display case and took it out. It just got sold out. As Julie smiled bitterly out of sheer regret. Ding, the store's door opened with a chime. Sylvia, a famous person that Julie knew well, came out, carrying the stuffed toy she was just looking at in her arms. Hello, Sylvia. Hi. Sylvia seemed disconcerted by their sudden encounter, but she soon realized that Julie's gaze was focused on her doll. Proudly, she declared, it's a gift. Who are you giving it to? No. I received it. She said something a little strange without realizing it, but it wasn't wrong in the first place. The definition of a gift was something that someone bought for another. She didn't pay for it, so it wasn't unreasonable to call it a gift. She didn't force him to buy it for her either. Sylvia proudly held the panda with her two hands. Julie smiled, expressing that she found it cute. I'm jealous. Have you ever actually seen a panda? Yes. I saw a real panda when I was a kid. Wow. Is that true? I'm so jealous. Julie. A familiar voice flowed from behind the white-haired knight. Sylvia immediately determined who it was. De Calaine. Finding Julie, he smiled at her. You're here. Oh, yes. Though a little late, the moment de Calaine's gaze fell on Sylvia, he introduced her to Julie. This is Sylvia, a talented wizard capable of challenging the eternal rank. Sylvia looked at de Calaine and Julie next to him alternately, the panda doll she just proudly showed off now hidden behind her. I know. I was just talking to her. I'll just go. Sylvia cut off Julie's words, bowed, then ran away. Julie watched her retreat into the distance. By the way, Julie, did you understand my theorem? She blushed. In fact, she couldn't understand the slightest bit of what he said. She only felt the flow of magic generated by the runes. D. Cullain smiled a little. It's all right. I didn't even expect it. You came because of sight in the first place. Julie trembled at those words but then shook her head. No. The invitation was, of course, given by the head of the family, but it was my will to come here. Is it? Yes. I'm serious. I see. Alan? The assistant professor who was still following D. Cullain's footsteps appeared. Yes. 
tour her around the island. The opportunity for a night to visit this place is rare. Oh, yes. All right. Nice to meet you, Night Julie. Alan smiled softly and bowed at Julie. I'm going. If I stay, it will be uncomfortable for you and me. Not necessarily, it has to be, doesn't it? He asked. Julie, who understood what he meant, simply smiled bitterly and nodded. D. Cullane then walked away, leaving her behind. Well, I should take you on the tourist course. Oh, we should head to the main island first. Oh, no, then. By any chance, night Julie. Can you tell me how much time you have? Depending on your answer, our course will be. As Alan panicked, Julie simply said, it's fine. I have a lot of time, so you don't have to think about it too much. Her voice was calming, serene. The sky was clear, allowing the huge sun to gaze down upon us from its throne, releasing rays of heat that turned the winds hot and humid. It was one of those days that met all the conditions that define the Empire's summer. After completing the symposium presentation, I returned to the University Tower. The board of directors held a reception using the entirety of one of the upper floors. The professors congratulated me, and Adrienne gave me the promised title. Head of Planning and Financial Coordination Office, D. Lane, in fact, this tower was built with gold rather than magic. It devoted itself to the investments by the state, territories, corporations, and the mana stones it received every year. The only fuel that ran this tower was money, which was why it was the most capitalist place in the world. In such a place, I seized the undisputed power of finance. Professor. This is the final lesson plan and a weekly guide to career counseling. Alan then appeared, handing me several documents. Classes had now ended, and the time for debutantes to think about their career paths had come. The tower offered career counseling to first-year to third-year wizards to give them a chance to ask for future advice from professors. In that sense, no one would apply to D. Cullane. Three people even applied for your counseling. Alan said brightly. I didn't really like how he worded it. Even? Oh, um. That. It's fine. I already know. I I apologize. I didn't mean it that way, I know. You may go. Alan went outside looking back several times, and I took a letter out of the sponsored mailbox. It was Efferine's letter this time again. Hello, it's me, Efferine, again. I got your response. It's going to be vacation soon. As I read it, I pulled out the pendant from the drawer. The Efferine I knew was honest and wasn't good at hiding her feelings. It seemed she had been that way since she was a child, considering she was smiling brightly, like always, in the photo, but... Why? Afarin's father wasn't smiling. He contrasted his child's joy sharply. His expression was just that terribly stiff. Wednesday noon, 77th floor of the tower. Sylvia stood in front of Professor D. Cullane's office. Knock, knock. Career counseling ran for a month before and after the final exam. Debutantes troubled by their future asked several professors for advice, but D. Cullane wasn't on the list of professors they could approach. According to the words written on the bulletin board, D. Cullane's direct words and actions were burdensome, or something along those lines. She thought only those who were weak would think like that. Knock, knock, considering them pitiful, Sylvia knocked once more. Assistant Professor Allen opened the door. Oh, Sylvia. Wait here. Another consultation is going on right now. Is there someone inside? Yes, but it will be over soon. Sylvia sat still and waited as Alan tapped this new typewriter. Tack, ta, tack, tack, his typing speed was fairly slow. After waiting for about ten minutes, the door to the counseling room opened. She raised her head and glared at the wizard. Arrogant affairing. Naturally, she was the first to come to her mind. Hmm? Sylvia? But Drent, the man burned at the stake by D. Cullane due to his thesis, was the one that came out. Oh are you surprised? Me too. Ha ha ha. Anyway, work hard. Drent left, scratching the back of his neck as if embarrassed. She didn't understand him at all, but she soon walked in. The head professor's counseling room was spacious and luxurious. No, the atmosphere of a certain person had colored the space with dignity. She walked over and sat down in front of him. D. Cullane, sitting on the counselor's seat, spoke indifferently. This is surprising. Sylvia. I didn't think you'd look for a career counselor. 
Yes, she nodded. I am. It was awkward to call it consultation. Her career path after passing the Solda promotion test was already half determined. Okay. What are your concerns? Sylvia remembered what Affairing told D. Colleen. I'll be proposing to be under your supervision. In doing so, I'll reveal what happened and the reason why my father committed suicide. He wouldn't want an arrogant and dumb wizard like her. Rather, he probably lamented for having to take that stupid wizard in. Hence, Sylvia decided to take a step forward. Should I apply under your supervision? She asked. She wanted to hear D. Colleen's definitive answer directly from him. She wiggled her fingers on her knees, puffing up her cheeks. He stared at her silently, wearing a surprised expression, which was unusual. Was he impressed? In fact, it was natural. Any professor would welcome Sylvia if she applied under them. The same went for Professor D. Colleen. She didn't have to worry about his response since, naturally, it would be in the form of affirmation. Good thoughts flooded Sylvia's head, but it's not a good choice. D. Colleen shook his head. Sylvia momentarily failed to comprehend his actions. Since when did shaking your head become a yes and nodding become a no? Did the universal body language change beyond my awareness? You are a talent that shouldn't be under anyone. She was taken aback by his words. Without realizing it, she brought her up. What about a fairing? A fairing is worth raising, and she's the daughter of my old assistant. Moreover, compared to you, she lacks a lot. Sylvia stared blankly at D. Colleen, her red, swollen cheeks shrinking. You have the qualities of a future archmage, so you should go to the Isle of Wizards' wealth instead. In a year or two, your skills will fully bloom, and you'll still have plenty of time to challenge the archmage trials. He was being honest. Professor D. Colleen was speaking with sincerity, even clearly praising her. But why did she feel this way? Why did she keep feeling like a sharp needle was stabbing her heart? Even if you apply, I won't take it. That was the decisive blow. Sylvia bowed like a withered sprout. For a long time, she didn't say anything. She just stayed still. It confused D. Colleen, but for her, it was a compliment she gave while suppressing the jealousy and twisted feelings that soared from her personality. Sylvia. Raise your head. Sylvia didn't do as instructed. Her actions were unusual. A small light twinkled under her closed eyelids. No way. That couldn't be tears. Comment below. What's your favorite part of the chapter?